going and accessing what I'm, what I'm, you know, in some ways entitled to, what I have, a, what I have a right to. I can go to free, not even pay. Um, so how do we get people over some of those issues that they have around stigma of going into other communities? Um, how do we look at housing as a factor? We know that people who are unstably housed have poor health outcomes, right? Because if you're unstably housed, you're, you're too busy worrying about where am I going to sleep tonight? Um, we see this with a lot of the young men that we serve, that they do what we call couch surf. So they're worried about where tonight am I going to lay my head. So I'm not worried about if I have my medications with me. I'm not worried about if I'm taking those medications because I'm too busy worrying about where am I going to sleep tonight. Um, the same thing we think about when we think about poverty and how poverty pays, plays a role in all of our communities and how we know that people who live in poverty-stricken communities have, in general, poor health outcomes. That also plays a role around unemployment. You see higher unemployment rates in communities that have higher rates of HIV infection and have poor health outcomes. So we know that all of these social determinants play a role. We can get people better education, we can get people higher levels of education, we see that they have improved health outcomes. We know that the higher someone's income, that they have better health outcomes. So these are some of the things that we have to think about in addressing how do we move people along the cascade is how do we address all the other things that a person has going on. Because when someone walks in our doors, it's not just about HIV today. It's about how am I taking care of my kids, how am I feeding my kids, my daughter doesn't have diapers, how am I going to take care of those needs and when I start to think about myself. Then I can think about me. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we did at Iris House was to start to look at our viral load suppression rates so that we could think about coming up with our own cascade of sorts. And so one of the things that we found, we took a sampling of our HIV positive clients for those people who we had at least two um, sets of lab data. And one of the things that was interesting to us is that we found that 73%, you see this on the bottom, 73% of our clients from this sample had achieved viral suppression. And we really started wanting to understand, like, what, was that, what did that mean and how did we get to these numbers? In housing, we had about 69% that had achieved viral suppression. In our Women's Supportive Services group, um, is 80%. In our harm reduction, 59%. So harm reduction, we kind of expected those results. We expected harm reduction to be less than some of our other programs because we know many of our clients in our harm reduction program are still current and active users. So we knew that those rates would be more because they don't access services um, consistently as our other populations of clients do. Um, what we saw is that when we compared our average to the national average, which was 21%, that we were almost 52% higher. And what we know makes the difference is supportive services. That we've seen that those clients who consistently come and are accountable to someone other than themselves have better health outcomes. So those clients who are consistently coming in for support groups, who are consistently meeting with their case managers on a regular basis, so not you know, kind of one off, now I have a crisis, I'm in the door. But those who are meeting those objectives in their programs, coming to the support groups, coming and seeing the nutritionist, coming and talking to one of our counselors, they were the ones who were seeing better health outcomes. And now our goal is how do we get them, how do we get everyone else to do the same thing? So we know those support <coughs> services are key. Next slide. Um, the other thing that we know is that in order to have people to continue to come and access the services, we have to make sure that everything else around them is stable. So we have to help to make sure they have housing. So we make sure that we do those necessary referrals for housing. And we're talking about it because what tends to happen in medical settings, a doctor doesn't have time to talk to you about your housing situation today. So you have to have these other support services so somebody can have that conversation with you. Where are you living? Do you have stable housing? When we say stable, we really need stable because we know we have some women who are in intimate partner violence relationships and that's not stable because at any point you are free. We know that when we help people to do, go to job training programs and we see better results because they are able to change their situations and to find employment. So we as community service organizations have to look at what are our role, what is our role in making sure that these support services are there but that people are actually accessing them and accessing them in a way that's meaningful and impactful for them. And the last thing I'll end on is just being sure that there's access to quality and culturally competent care. And when I say culturally competent, it's, I want to emphasize culturally competent is specific to the individual. Because what is culturally competent for me as an African-American woman is not culturally competent for my sister sitting at this table who's an African-American woman. Culturally competent means different things depending on the individual and it has to be specific. Meaning that I can't refer all of my clients to one place for services. I can't refer them all to one place for health care. I have to look at who the providers are and will those providers be able to work with this particular client? Will the providers be 
to be able to provide the services that this particular person is going to need. If this person needs more hand holding, hand holding, will they be able to do that? If this person needs more than 15 minutes, are they going to have someone to be able to do that with them to explain things better? Working with pharmacies, you can do the same thing. You can explain the medication and take the time that people need. So culturally competent, again, has to be specific to the individual. Um, so again, I think for us, we've seen that community service, community um, organizations play a huge role in providing the service and support that people need to help to move them. And we've seen that with our own viral suppression rates that when people are connected to supportive services, we've been seeing improved health outcomes. Thank you. Hello, well first I'd just like to um, thank uh, Janet Weinberg, who is our CEO, for um, taking the steps to ensure that the actual consumers are involved in panels of this nature. Um, and I think she's doing a great job, and I think that this is just one of the reflections of the work that she's uh, been doing in just a few short months. And of course, uh, I would have to thank uh, uh, Krishna Stone and uh, Lynn, who are uh, members of the board, who's members of her administration who make these things actually happen, carry out these policies. Um, now, I'm not sure if she's going to be so happy after I start babbling on for like the next few minutes, but you know, we'll see. Let's hope that it doesn't get too bad. Um, and just along those lines, I wanted to acknowledge some of the officers of the Consumer Advisory Board who are here tonight. And Ed Shaw is our Chairman Emeritus. I think everybody in the HIV community knows Ed Shaw. Um, we have Nick Capano, who is um, the Chairperson of our Bylaws Committee. And we have Donald Miller, who is uh, our now Acting Secretary, correct? Of the CAD. And we have, as has been stated, Stephanie Valerie, who was just elected uh, the Vice Chair of the CAD, and as was pointed out, she is the only second woman that's been elected in that uh, position. So first of all, I'm glad, and I'll tell an inside joke, I am so happy that she won this election because one of the things the Vice Chair has to do is work with the chairperson, and she is going to be a welcome joy to work with. Um, so I say that also to segue into what I want to talk about, a how a symbolic act like that, and I think it's important because, of course, Stephanie is competent in her own right. She uh, uh, brings her own set of credentials uh, to the position, but she also brings a symbolism to the position that she says uh, to women, particularly women of color, that HIV is an issue and that we are part of dealing with this issue. So just this symbolic act alone is important because what I like to talk about in this cascade is the stigma that particularly in black and Latino communities, particularly with black and Latino men, particularly with black and Latino young men, and how that stigma is still uh, having an impact on people even entering into the different phases of a cascade or any type of prevention or treatment model. And how that stigma, particularly in those communities, can be addressed so that we can allow people to even engage in these processes itself. And I just thought to tell you a story around stigma and the, there's two kind of phrases, there's two kind of phases of it. One is the quote unquote unquote kind of professional uh, black or Latino man or professional black or Latino woman who people would assume are knowledgeable and people would assume would be the logical person to access care. I got a problem, or I think I may have a problem, it just as I treat everything in my work life, I am going, and just like I probably treat every other health issue I have, I'm going to access care and deal with it. Well, the stigma around that is kind of different because still within the black and Latino community, the stigma of HIV is really kind of powerful for a lot of different reasons. Mainly, of course, is you're gay, which the black and Latino community is still struggling with in a lot of different ways. Even though there may be in some situations a kind of tact acceptance in some way, there still is an undercurrent of that stigma that makes people act in ways that are detrimental to themselves and maybe to others. And I'll give you a quick example. It's many years ago, um, when I was a young guy like Ed, um, I was working um, for a congressman uh, up on the hill. And um, it was a, uh, I won't get to name the person, but there was African-American congressman, and they, of course, 
and anybody who's been involved in um, uh, electoral politics or been involved working with the legislature, it's a very tight, tight kind of cordage, and most people gravitate towards like the dialogue. The, African-Americans sit with the African-Americans, Latinos sit with the Latinos, women use with the women, on and on. That's, Congress doesn't, it reflects those realities. So the black, the African-American and Latino legislators pretty much hung together, and the staffs kind of much hung together, so that was kind of the circle. Well, it turns out that one of the staff members um, who was gay also found out that they was HIV positive, and it became a panic especially around that, in that time, because even though we knew, and at that time myself, I had not come out, they'd be afraid of saying anything. Why? Because I knew, and we probably see this to the daily, even though quote unquote progressive black and Latino officials sometimes come out and say, oh, we don't have any problem with it, and it's okay. In private, at the Thanksgiving Day dinners, it's kind of not okay. And you get that message before you come out. And sometimes say, wait, is that person in public the same person that was at Thanksgiving dinner with me? You know, there's two different people. Um, so that makes you not wanting to say anything even stronger. So what happened is this staff member was in a panic because some of us knew each other was gay, but having HIV, that was even, even more of an issue. And the problem there is that the stigma of coming out, of saying anything, because even on a job setting, in a professional setting, if you go to the to the to the HR person, they have to file paperwork, and people can kind of tell what's going on with that. So, long story short, he um, uh, was concerned he was going to get fired. Concerned he may lose his clearance uh, because at that time also he could be subject to the bribery if you were gay. So we found out that Deborah Fraser Howell was coming, and that time she was the head of the Black Leadership Council of AIDS. And since we were political people, we did something political. We went and said, if this guy is pushed, we're going to go to Deborah Fraser Howell when she comes here. We're going to make say this to her, and she's going to go crazy. So we never said it to her. Years later, I did tell her that story. She was so pleased. The guy kept his job, but he didn't tell anybody he was HIV positive. He said he was gay. And we're not clear if he was treated, if he was able to access the medications for that. So I tell that story because you know, without the charts and, 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 and all the statistics that, that, that have been just really, uh, really excellent displayed here tonight, to make, to start the conversation with people.